Hey, Kickstarter. How you doing? Pete Daring, glad to be back here. Really nice to see you. Next to my sidekick, Dane Jones. Say hi to Dane. How you going? Well, um, you guys may know me from uh, the past 10 campaigns that we've done, or just from the end bit of this where I was written in as some sort of cocky CEO who tends to eat off everybody's plates, uh, completely ignoring, I don't know, normal protocol and, and doing rude things. Um, I just would like to defend myself a little bit. There. I don't, I don't, I do eat off people's plates, but I generally wait until they're done. In fact, uh, I tend to not order my own lunch around here because there's usually enough scraps to eat off everybody's plate. And so maybe that's where the writer was getting that from. I don't know, Vic. Do you got any? Where'd that come from? CEO or homeless guy. Man. CEO or homeless guy. Anyway. We're really glad to be here. Uh, honestly, being back on Kickstarter is incredibly fun. Um, these are the, the uh, there's, there's no time of the year where the company is more engaged, the community is more engaged. We're actually back and we're talking to the people who've made Peak Design what it is. And so, yeah, just incredibly happy to be here after way too long of a respite. Um, but like I said in, the, uh, in, in that tail end section there, we've got a lot of fun stuff coming up. But right now, we're going to talk about Micro clutch. All right. Yeah. Let's get Jen, into it. Jen, we got any questions coming on? Because if we don't, I'm, I've also got a, I've got one that's burning for myself, uh, for Dane that I've asked him before. But let's go to the crowd first if there are any questions. Well, questions start rather than Dane sort of You want you want him to go over like? Yeah, we're gonna have him talk a little bit about like the L plate versus I plate. <clears throat> That seems like a good idea. Let's. Okay, we'll stick to the script. Then, what was the first one there, Jen? L plate versus I plate. L plate, I plate. Talk to me, Dane. Well, I guess before we even get into that, just kind of as a, uh, a broad overview of the new product. So this is micro clutch. We have on these four smaller cameras in front of us, uh, four smaller mirrorless cameras, and then we also have our existing hand strap clutch. Um, if you're not familiar with micro clutch, micro clutch is a new hand strap from Peak Design, specifically made for smaller mirrorless cameras. Um, we have two versions. We have an L plate and we have an I plate. Um, and this product is uh, quite different from our existing product, Clutch. So Clutch uses a standard plate uh, for mounting. Um, and our new micro clutch product has a, uh, a nice piece of CNC uh, machined aluminum uh, plate on the bottom. And uh, this, this product, so like Clutch was designed specifically for DSLR cameras, this new product is designed specifically for those smaller mirrorless camera crab. Uh, uh, fully. I bet, I bet the majority of the people who are, are tuning into this are pretty deeply familiar already with Micro Clutch. I can't imagine this is your first time interacting with it, so hopefully watch that, cool. that awesome video. I think that like specifically I-plate, L-plate, you came to a fork in the road during the development, sure. and we decided to make two SKUs, mm -hmm. which, SKU creep, Dane, come on, man. Yeah. That's not what we wanted. We yeah, that's not what Talk we wanted. Me. Why'd you do that? Yeah, so about midway through development, uh, we looked at the camera. So the cameras, so micro clutch was always intended to be an eye plate for these smaller mirrorless cameras like the Fujifilm X100 or the X10 or some of these other similar kind of rectilinear cameras with no grip on them. Uh, when we looked at the camera breakdown of what our current, um, you know, the average peak design customer in terms of camera, what they were owning, um, I would say a majority of them were actually. Uh, we're owners of cameras with these larger grips. Um, there's a little bit of a funky ergonomic issue that happens when you have a larger grip on a camera where because the grip is coming off the front of the camera, your hand kind of, as you grip the camera, your hand advances a little bit forward. Um, and in the case where you would just have the eye plate, you'd be having to bury your hand a little bit deeper into that strap. You'd end up with probably a little bit discomfort there. So we've alleviated that discomfort by making another iteration of micro clutch, the L plate that moves the strap a little bit forward uh, and makes the, the product overall way more comfortable to use. I have to say, when Dane was initially going through these prototypes, I was a little bit dubious as to like, come on, is it, are we seriously going to make two different variants of that skew with that fairly subtle differentiation? And I just, you know, almost in retrospect, it's like the very most peak design thing to do. And I'm very glad that we've decided to do it and kind of take on the additional burden of filling up all of our warehouses with two SKUs instead of one. Um, but it absolutely makes the difference when you've got um, that pronounced grip. So 
uh, kudos, Dane. Um, you know, not not the easy path, uh, but the better path. So certainly not. I mean, you can't ignore the fact that it's like 30, 30 <laughs> to 40 percent of our users are using Sony A7s or cameras with a very similar style. So we wanted to make sure that we made those people happy and they were getting a, the best experience possible. Totally. And you know, through that, we were also like, well, on the A7 series, clutch itself is actually kind of decent already. You know, some people are going to prefer that and. We, you know, like all Peak Design products, like this has just been so deeply thought about for such a long time. Um, and that's why you end up having the skew iterations that we've got here. So anyway, hell of, hell of a job on that decision, Dane. Dave, what else? With the L plate and the I plate, <clears throat> people are asking, can you use an I plate on a camera that we recommend an L plate on? Yeah, the short answer is yes, you can physically attach an I plate to a camera that works better with an L plate. Um, but you are going to run into, in some cases, that kind of weird ergonomic issue where you feel like you have to bury your hand kind of too deeply mm -hmm. in the strap. And so we recommend that you get the product that was designed specifically for those larger cameras with larger grips. Uh, now, if I'm a customer, I might own both, of, uh, both types of cameras, right? And, but I might only want to buy one micro clutch. Now, I have taken on my Sony A7, taken an eye plate and cheated it a little bit. It mm -hmm. looks ugly on the bottom. It's very antithetical, I'm sure, to you, Dane, as uh, someone who enjoys rectilinear combinations. Um, but uh, yeah, does that work? It, physically, again, it can work. Yeah. Um, what you are losing in, by kind of cheating it forward a little bit by that is you are losing some of the contact uh, between the pad on the bottom of the plate mm -hmm. um, that provides a little bit of friction there to prevent the plate from rotating. Yep. So it, it will work in a pinch, but it's not the optimal solution. Yeah. If only you had a tool to tighten that screw down sufficiently. Yeah to grab it with minimal pad contact. Yeah, we did think about that. <laughs> we'll get to more on that later. Thanks, Jen. What else um, we got? Can you talk a little bit more about the decision to not make the whole base plate hardware compatible? Sure, yeah. yeah we, get, we get a lot of questions on that. Um, and to kind of reiterate what I, what I think most people are asking for is the existing micro clutch plate um, does not have the arc of geometry built into the periphery of the plate. We actually did prototype that, and uh, the person who I think was pushing for that most strongly was actually you. Um, and we did prototype that and actually showed you that prototype, and I think we both had a similar reaction, which is that doesn't feel like a very refined or good looking product. Um, the aesthetics is one portion of that. The other portion of that is um, when you actually look at, so for, for those of you who are not familiar with the ARCA, standard. The, it's a base gear dovetail. It's about 38 millimeters wide. That's the dimension that's critical. Micro clutch is 28 millimeters wide. So it's a full CM narrower than the ARCA plates. And when we prototype the plate with the full dovetail, the full ARCA uh, dovetail in it, uh, for smaller cameras, things like the Fuji X10 or cameras that are um, even smaller than that, the width of the plate basically breaks the profile on the front and back of the camera. So you look, you know, we, we meant for this to look really good on small cameras. That's mm -hmm. the, the camera type that this product is uh, very compelling for. And so we are optimizing for that. So we looked at that plate option and it was basically, it looks like this huge hunk of metal that was hanging off the end of the plate. We both looked at it and we're like, mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not good enough mm -hmm. for us. That's not a good looking product. It doesn't look svelte. It doesn't look like it's part of the camera. Um, the other thing worth mentioning too is Putting ARCA geometry into the plate doesn't give us capture compatibility, and that is part of our design requirements for this product, is that our ecosystem of products works together. So even if we were to give ARCA integration into the base plate, in order to get capture compatibility, you would still need the standard plate or a custom ARCA plate that snaps in on over it. And when you get two ARCA plates snapped on over top of each other, it's a lot of metal, yeah. a lot of pieces moving around. So we opted not to do that, and we opted to go with the thing that is the most felt, the most best looking version of the product, the lightest weight version. So not everybody uses Arca. If you're one of the people who doesn't use a tripod, does a lot of street photography, you're getting the, you know, you can, you can basically configure this product. So it's the most lightweight, it's the most unobtrusive, it's the best looking version of the product on your camera. And if you need that Arca compatibility, if you need tripod compatibility, it's there and it stays, you know, has a little magnetic attachment, comes with the product, you can snap mm -hmm. it on there and it works in all Arca tripods, works with their own travel tripod and works with capture. Hell yeah. Yep. Great job, Dan. I mean, there, I, I recall even, I think you did a lot of humoring me on this project. There was a little you, bit you, of humoring in there, you, yeah. You, you probably made, 
I mean, that's because you can't tell this guy to like, hey, whip up a quick prototype. The guy, the fidelity of this guy's prototypes are insane. I mean, they, they, were, they were better than like our finished product for the first four years. And that's always been the case. Like you can't half-ass anything, even if I want you to. But uh, I remember thinking that like, okay, we could actually put Arca geometry, excuse me, capture geometry and Arca just on one end, right? Mm -hmm. It would be kind of this funny little cantilevering thing. But you even prototype that up, it was quickly, a, you know, it, it was a bad idea. Uh, yeah, I believe um, the issue was that you only got one orientation of the yeah. camera, and, it, and if it was not optimal, then it was this weird. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. But you still prototyped it in exquisite detail. We looked at it. <laughs> we looked at it. Um, this guy. I think people can't hear me, so you have to reiterate. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll repeat. Talk about uh, L plate integration, L bracket. Talk about L, br okay, L bracket integration. Another uh, question we get a lot, which is, uh, well, there's, I, there's subtle variations of this question, but the, the two, that, two variations of the question we get is, why isn't this product an L bracket with a hand strap on it? That's one variation. The other variation is, will micro clutch play nicely with third party L brackets? Um, the answer to will micro clutch play with these third party, or basically mount or stack with those third party L brackets is, again, it's physically possible if you found the right fastener. Uh, we don't necessarily recommend that. Um, and we don't provide a fastener that's going to enable any third party L bracket to go on over the top of micro clutch. And the reason for that is the experience to get to the battery door we've tried to make as smooth as possible. Um, we would lose that experience if we allowed that third party uh, mounting because then you'd, you'd pull micro, in order to get micro clutch off, you have to get the L bracket off. So you pull in a screw off, the L, L brackets comes, lo uh, comes loose, and then you still have the micro clutch plate. And so now you have a bunch of plates attached to each other with a screw. It becomes kind of a handful of plates that are spinning around relative to each other. So the experience of removal and reattachment uh, is pretty terrible with trying to integrate a third party piece of hardware over the top of micro clutch. Um, I think probably what's also very important is we didn't set out to design an L bracket. We set out with a very specific goal in mind, which is to design a hand strap for smaller mirrorless cameras that had no market solution. So a lot of the existing solutions on the market were taking products that were meant for DSLR cameras and just porting them or trying to convince the user base that that solution works well for these cameras. And the reality is it just doesn't. You mm -hmm. need a completely different architecture to make it work with these smaller cameras. And so that's what we set out to do. We didn't set out to create an L bracket and then just tack a hand strap on. A micro clutch mm -hmm. is built around its primary function, which is being a hand strap. Mm -hmm. And the plate, although it looks like half of an L bracket, is just part of making that hand strap solution work. So we feel that they're quite different products. We don't feel that this is an L bracket or close to an L bracket with a, with a hand strap just glued on the end. Absolutely. And you know, in order to make any sort of a credible L bracket actually fit on any camera, you have to design for a camera specific product. And that's also something that Peak Design, this is more of kind of a, a top level business strategy. We're just not interested in doing that. Um, we think that there's, you know, can that be done? Of course. Um, but then you're left kind of chasing all these different camera companies. Um, it is, uh, they're, they're not fun and creative problems to solve. There's not a universality to them. When that camera becomes obsolete, that product becomes obsolete. Um, and I also just think that there's, there's, you know, there, there's going to be, this is a much more elegant solution for a much wider range of customers. Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump on that kind of same uh, train of thought there, which is the advantage from the user standpoint is that you can possibly buy one micro clutch and use it across a bunch of different cameras instead of having to buy a bunch of different micro clutch plates. Mm -hmm. So if you have cameras with similar body styles, you don't need to buy multiple plates. You just buy one and you can kind of transpose it to whatever camera you're using that day. Um, you already mentioned the upgrade, upgrading the cameras. If, mm -hmm. if, if you upgrade the camera and even if the body style is similar, you might, that might necessitate you to buy a whole new product again, which is a bummer. Um, so it helps those people who basically are going to upgrade their camera to a similar camera style maintain the usability of that plate. You don't have to buy multiple plates for the multiple cameras you own if they happen to have similar body styles. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seem, it, the, I think the, the third part of that too is if we had made camera specific plates, we would have kind of naturally focused on the most popular cameras, leaving a lot of people who have cam you know, cameras that could benefit from micro clutch mm -hmm. kind of out <coughs> in the cold there. You know, there's going to be a bunch of cameras that we never even thought about designing micro clutch for that will be compatible with this product. And those people are going to, you know, get to play in this ecosystem. Well, otherwise they would not. Right on. Solid points, Dane. Jen, what's next? Battery door access. 
Uh -huh. mm. Sure. Yeah, another thing I think we uh, had a lot of like really, uh, well, that, that conversation I think kind of happened throughout microclutch development. I think mm -hmm. internally um, there was a lot of, I guess, trepidation to block the battery door. The, the actual reason for like from a design standpoint, the reason you block the battery door is because we are designing for a universal solution. So you mentioned the camera specific, that's the way most people get around the, the battery door issue is they design a camera specific version of the plate. We can't do that in a universal version because you can't plan for where that battery door is going to be at. Um, so in order to maintain that universality, we're kind of created that problem and then we try to solve that problem as creatively as possible. Uh, through basically two different design choices. One is to integrate the tool into the bottom of the, uh, or the uh, micro clutch plate itself. So there is a little tool, little flat tool that's basically stowed um, in the base of the plate. It's pretty seamless. It's easy to extract. It's easy to reinstall. It doesn't look like it's even there. It's not going to fall out or get lost. And we thought, yeah, having the tool on hand is like, that's always going to be faster than fishing for a tool in your pockets or fishing for a tool in your bag. So that should make the, that battery door access problem far less painful. And the other thing is, um, and I have to give credit to uh, our lead engineer, Tom, here, which is coming up with this quick detach functionality. So the plate itself, uh, you don't have to basically unthread the fastener completely to get micro clutch off the bottom of the camera. It needs basically one 360 degree revolution to loosen the plate, and then the whole plate slides over the fastener. Mm -hmm. um, Credit goes to Tom for coming up with a pretty creative and fairly low-tech solution for getting that uh, plate off the bottom of the camera fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Show it I'm, off, Dave. Let's see it. You guys want to see it? Yeah, you guys want to see it? Yeah, yeah. So, tools here on the side of the camera. Basically extract the tool. Thing comes off. This battery door is probably not going to come open because this, uh, oh, there we go. It's a little bit of an older camera. So you get to your battery door, change your battery out. So instead of normally you would have to basically kind of get the fastener back in position, get it on the, on the bottom of the camera, start it threading, and then get your tool on, we've avoided all that. So you basically just slide the plate right back over the fastener. One 360-degree revolution to get it back on, and it's on there tight. Totally. It's almost a fun part of the pro like. The, the tool nests so magically and pops out so wonderfully that it is, it's kind of fun to actually get the chance to operate that. So um, I was a, a, a deep skeptic of blocking the battery door. Um, and uh, honestly, you guys just innovated around it. And is a help a, a, a bunch of solutions that I'm I'm so impressed by. It's really fun to work with. That said, we I mean I think it's probably important to know here. There's going to be a few people who the battery door issue may still be a problem. So if you're a wedding photographer or for whatever reason you you can't have any obstruction, like the fact that there's even a battery door upsets you, mm -hmm. um, this product may not be for you. Mm -hmm. We're we're pretty transparent about that. If you're if you're a street photography shooter or you're you know you don't need these basically super timed battery door changes, then I mm -hmm. think this product will work really well for those people. But if you are somebody who basically has three seconds to change a battery, then the battery door obstruction, I think, will probably be a no-go for those users. That's fair. Yeah. Related to that, Jane, can you talk about why you can't use it? Or can you use a coin in there? Or why you didn't make it? Ah, uh, yes. Coins may as well cover the whole hex drive question yeah, yeah. as well. It, question. Yeah. Why uh, the question is, and this was my question earlier, is Dane, why oh why did you not make this slot be able to receive a coin mm -hmm. or a hex drive, sure. four millimeter hex key? Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll address the coin one first. So this came up, believe, believe it or not, during tripod development, I think quite a bit. I think a lot of people wanted this easy to access, almost, I wouldn't call it toolless, but you know, coins are pretty ubiquitous, right? You can easily find one of those and, and back the fastener out. The problem is, is that Compared to the actual tool that's installed in MicroClutch, the coin just does not give you enough input torque to get the plate securely on the bottom of the camera. So you could enable that. So you can enable people to, to use a, a coin to install this thing. But the problem is, is that uh, those same users are likely going to have the experience of having the plate move when they're mm -hmm. actually using the product because they weren't able to deliver enough input torque into that adjustment fastener to get the plate securely on the bottom of the camera. So instead of creating that problem for ourselves and our users, we opted to come up with the best solution, which is create a custom tool for them that allows them to get enough input torque into the fastener that the plate's going to be securely on the bottom of the camera. Um, that's, that's my response to the coin. Um, the, the four millimeter hex thing, 
was driven largely, again, um, by the, the aesthetics and optimizing for the smallest camera possible. So I think during some of the earliest prototypes possible, um, I think the plate was maybe a seven or eight millimeters thick. I, you probably remember this. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty thick aluminum plate mm -hmm. in one of the first iterations of it. And I, when I showed, showed that first version to a lot of people, the response was, on a small camera, that looks big. That looks mm -hmm. heavy. And even if it's not adding a lot of physical weight to the camera, the fact that it looks heavy mm -hmm. uh, was off-putting. Mm -hmm. So we went back to the drawing board and we tried to figure out, well, how are we going to get, you know, the, the plate thickness was largely driven by how thick the tool was. A four millimeter hex is four millimeters thick. Mm -hmm or very close to it. And we had also chosen the route of full encapsulation of the tool, not biasing the tool to one side of the plate or the other to prevent accidental uh, loss of the tool and to make sure that nobody's knocking the tool out or snagging the tool and you know they go to use the tool and it's not there. We wanted to get the plate thickness down and the way to do that was to slim the tool. Mm -hmm. that, that was the driver for the plate thickness. So the only way to get millimeters off of the plate mm -hmm. was to go to a different tool format in this case, a flat tool, a custom flat tool that integrates cleanly with the base of the plate. Mm -hmm. And I think we made, when we made that, that change, we got about two millimeters of thickness out of the plate. And that was kind of the threshold that we needed to pass mm -hmm. to go from something that looked quite thick and bulky to something that looked integrated with the camera and that a lot of people don't even really know is part of the camera. Yep. Often they flip the camera over and we have to show them it's a separate part of the camera. It is absolutely the right the right choice in in the tool and the architecture and the slot here and I think that uh, you you fought hard for that and um, uh, ma made a great call I later in the development I brought up why don't we at least put the female mm -hmm. hex head so sure. that like any four millimeter hex tool not the one that you're burying here but why would you not do that? Yeah, and I had I think I had a couple different responses for you. You did. Maybe you didn't it was, buy all of them. It was <laughs> it was lengthy. We could yeah. continue because sure. I, I do know that our backers are are like if they don't like we have to address that specifically. Yep. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go through a couple different responses I had for that. The first one is when you look at a, a pretty non-standard fastener like that, some people are going to look at that and go, ah, flat hood. Uh, flat, uh, flat tool plus hex, like uh, it's a, it's a either or. Mm -hmm. uh, but some users might look at that and go, I don't, I've never seen this fastener before. What do I do with that? Mm -hmm. Is that do I use the hex? Do I do the flat? Well, if the hex is there, why is there a flat tool? Why didn't you guys include both tools? When do I use which tool and when? Mm -hmm. Is there is one a backup? Is it should you know is is one going to damage the fastener? Is it a, you know is it a plan B? Like so there's a there's kind of a you look at it and you're like, a lot of people may not know what to, how to interact with that fastener. Um, the other one is a similar argument to the coin, which is, well, why can't you allow people to use coins? Well, if we open up the architecture to the four millimeter hex and you no longer have control over what four millimeter hex people are using, mm -hmm. somebody could use a four millimeter hex driver bit and think that that's good enough to get the plate on. And the bottom line is, is that there's going to be people who are going to over torque the fastener because they're using a tool that's huge and they're mm -hmm. going to deliver too much torque to the fastener and potentially damage their camera without intentionally doing so. or they're using a tool that's too small that's not delivering enough input torque and they're having this horrible experience of never being able to get the plate firmly situated on the bottom of their camera. So in order to combat that, we said, let's give people the, the tool that's meant for the job and let's put it in the actual plate so they always have it there on hand. I think those are the two big things. I thought that um, I was, I recall the conversation. I bought it. I bought what you were saying. Mm -hmm. I still didn't love it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you put so much thought into this product. This is your product. This is your baby. And uh, I, like, I, I totally accept the decision you make. And I do think, judging by all my four, you know, four millimeter hex tools, like, you will begin to, to kind of pull the edges of, the, of, of that female hex slot. Because putting a hex in here, like, it really limits the purchase that you have when you have the slot and you're only engaging a couple points of that hex. I mean, so yeah. it, it, it basically, it would result in a product that would degrade more quickly. And this one, I don't think that you've got such good engagement from that flat tool. Mm -hmm. That's going to last the test of time. And I don't think that people are going to lose this tool because it's just too damn fun to put back in this thing. And it just finds itself. It's worth mentioning, I mean, the, the likelihood you're going to lose the tool is very low. We're also going to have, obviously, as with most Peak Design products, replacements available if you do happen to use it. If you do find yourself in a situation where the tool's missing and you, you can't get our wonderful support people on the line in time to basically ship you a tool fast enough, you can. I think it's a quarter-inch flathead. We'll get you out of a pinch sure. if you need to open that fastener up. Right on. Thorough answer, Dane. Thank you, my friend. Um, how about clutch versus micro clutch? 
Ah, great. Yeah, good question. So clutch versus micro clutch. Why did yeah? Why did we decide to go with a whole new architecture? So as I mentioned, kind of in the beginning of this, uh, clutch was developed for these larger DSLR cameras, um, and specifically for these cameras. And and these these cameras usually have a shutter release that's sitting kind of forward. Your your pointer finger can usually access that shutter release quite easy. Uh, the cameras are usually quite tall, so I have fairly large hands, and even this camera is about the same height as my forefingers or about the, the width of my palm. When you start to get into these smaller cameras, especially the Fujifilm cameras that have the shutter release on the top side of the camera, having all four fingers go through a strap, it basically makes it almost impossible to access the shutter release. That's one immediate issue. The other issue is the camera itself, my hand is now taller than the camera body itself. And what happens is with clutch, your hand starts to be like forcibly curled around the bottom of the camera. If, if our description of the discomfort doesn't convince you, you should definitely stop by one of our flagship stores and actually bring your smaller mirrorless camera in and try clutch out on it. I think you'll convince yourself that that product, uh, while very useful for DSLRs and some larger mirrorless cameras, is not a good fit for these cameras. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an ergonomic nightmare. There's the, the hand size issue, there's the lack of being able to reach, uh, release, uh, reach the shutter release and all the buttons. It's just not meant for smaller mirrorless cameras. Yep. Cool. Um, kind of it for that. Another question that I've gotten a lot is about battery grips. Do they work if you're going to use a battery grip? Yeah, so if you have a battery grip, uh, whether you have a DSLR or you have a mirrorless camera with a larger battery grip, so clutch is designed specifically for uh, DSLRs, but it also has enough length in the band to span the additional uh, height added by a battery grip. We did not that design that feature into uh, this product, MicroClutch, because we were designing specifically for those smaller mirrorless cameras that typically don't have battery grips on them. Mm -hmm. We wanted to keep the product, again, felt. If we made the strap super long to span that distance, then you'd end up with a product with a band that's basically hanging out of the end of the thing and the tail's flopping all over the place. It does not look like an integrated product. Totally. And it's just not a common configure for smaller mirrorless cameras. Using a heavy battery grip is not it's a common configuration that we encounter. It also adds a lot of weight to the camera, and there is a weight threshold for micro clutch. You could you could make micro clutch in incompatible with a camera by adding the weight of a battery grip or adding a very large lens. And yeah. we've kind of experimented that in, in the office to figure out well at what point mm -hmm. is a camera too heavy for micro clutch? And I think. The answer to that is around two and a half to three pounds uh, weight. Obviously, you could go more than that, but mm -hmm. because of the way micro clutch is basically leveraged on your fingers to hold your camera, if you make the camera too heavy, it'll start to slide off your fingers. And actually, the same is true with, with clutch. You, mm -hmm. you can get a camera that's too heavy for clutch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find I use actually pretty big lenses on my on my A6500 and my and my A7 III. And I do feel the pressure here because I'm using a, a, a 150 yeah. to 500. And sure. It's, it's crazy. Um, but I still actually find it useful to have mm -hmm. um, just because of the added security that you have there. So Yeah, while you won't be able to walk around kind of with your camera hanging off your right. fingers, it's certainly still going to give you the support and added control that's the same as Clutch Wolf for that camera. Totally. Thanks. Jen, what's up? Another question. Or both, both plates and one micro clutch. Uh, so n no, I, I think what you're saying is like be able to get the the, the fabric part, uh, so so that that is swappable. Um, it's just not a swappable um, um, thing. That the, they're probably they're ah. wondering about the manufacturing and assembly process. Sure. Yeah. That like prevents that. Yeah. Why why isn't modular essentially? Yeah. Yeah. So the strap again to maintain the integration with the camera and to maintain the clean kind of a, you know very design forward. Uh, you know, aesthetics of this product, the strap is integrated with the actual plate. Mm -hmm. it's, d it's a done for not only to look visually integrated and just to look like a cleaner product, but it's also done for strength. Yeah. Cool. And then another is how easy is it to change out the tripod mount and capture clip plate? Like how, how, to go back and forth between the configurations? Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to do here is, um, so I have one version with the actual capture plate on it. Um, I'm going to grab the different fastener here. Mm-hmm. Let's see here. Because the two do not use the same fastener, that's... Um, I think that's worth showing off. Yeah, so I'll actually take both out here, the components. So those are the two fasteners that come with micro clutch. It also comes with the custom standard plate. In order to swap between the two, uh, you would remove micro clutch as normal so you can access the tool. 
So the removal is the same as if the arca plate was not on there. You still basically do one 360 degree re uh, revolution of the screw and then when you slide the plate off you can feel the magnets will kind of take over and grab the end of that arca plate so that when you take the entire, you know, entire assembly off your plate this won't drop off. The, that worst case scenario is that we didn't do that and your arc plate goes tumbling off into the dirt. So this will sit here and you can let this hang off the bottom of your camera and you won't let, it won't drop. You can just take the longer fastener that's meant for that arca plate out. You take the smaller fastener, put that in the bottom of the camera. This, just let's see if I can give a, a better view here. So in order to remove this, this is literally just held on with magnets. So they, they will find each other and kind of bring each other into a home position but it's very easy to remove. Once it's in the adjustment slot, it can't rotate and it also can't pull out. So it's very secure once it's in that position. But to take it off, you literally just yank it out. Once you have the smaller fastener in there, you take the plate, you just slide it over the bottom. Take your tool here, tighten up your plate, restill your tool and that's it. That's basically all you gotta do to go back and forth between the Arca and the non-Arca configuration. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good, man. Jen, what's next? Um, some of our Fuji users want to know when or if we'll be releasing a silver version. Ah, another hot <laughs> question. <laughs> and I think historically Peak Design has released silver versions of most of our products, right? Usually we launch with black and then there's, you know, th yeah. there's usually a lot of interest at some point in a silver version, I think. But people usually blame that on me and like and and aren't happy with it so <laughs> they, they point to the results and they show they're like look we only sell 10 percent of the silver why'd you make us do that mm. so i don't know if i got the guts for it um i mean i like i, don't I know. want a silver version just for the record i have a silver mm. fujifilm camera and, yeah and I, okay. I love one so i think are, are you going to make the soft goods in in uh in silver as well I don't think... Will you accept this in black? I will, because the leatherette on most of these silver cameras is black. There's like a, a couple of exceptions, weird exceptions. Maybe the Leica Ghost Edition, I think, is, stands apart a little bit from most silver mm -hmm. cameras, and then it has a non-black leatherette mm -hmm. in a lot of the soft goods products. But I actually, you know, it wouldn't... It would, it, not only would it not bother me, I'd actually prefer that the soft goods portion of the, the product remain black, and that mm -hmm. the uh, metal, basically all the metallic components uh, go to silver. Yeah, I mean... What about, though, easy enough with, with the plate, right? Because this is the same specs as Capture as far as the mm -hmm. same recycled aluminum mm -hmm. that we're using, same machining specs. Um, but what about this fancy tool of yours? Is, yeah. this, is this MIMMED, by the way? Uh, it is MIMMED, yeah. So yes. for those of you who don't know what MIM is, it's metal injection molding. It's for a lot of the tools that we have, the integrated tools that are magnetically stowed within products, we use a, pro a process called metal injection molding, which allows us to get uh, really high resolution, basically any conceivable geometry that can be injection molded in very high hardness with special alloys if we need them. And that's found in tripod, that's found in the mobile tripod, and it's also found in this, in this product here. Um, we could, yeah, the, the matching, matching of finishes is always um, a little bit of a exercise in, you know, patience. And they're basically going through a number of samples trying to make sure that the finishes match. And I, I, I do think, you know, matching aluminum to steel you're never really going to get a perfect match there, but I mm -hmm. think the, the, there are, believe it or not, there are, have been some silver versions kicking around the office that were no late prototypes. Okay. The, the match was actually fairly good, and that's with no effort put into trying to match finishes. So I think if we did make a silver version of this, a lot of attention would be paid to making sure that the finishes match as closely as possible and that things meet Peak Design's aesthetic standard before we release that product. What's the finish on the tool? Uh, the tool is uh, media blasted and then it's uh, PVD coated. So PVD for, yeah, for most okay. stainless steel fasteners or just stainless steel uh, components for um, Peak Design products, we use a pretty expensive and, and like fairly durable PVD coating. We don't mm -hmm. use black ox. We've kind of phased black oxide out of most of yep. our fasteners due to environmental concerns and corrosion, con corrosion issues. Yep, right on. Same PVD coating on the That's on, right. on yeah. this fastener as well. Okay, cool. Thanks, Dave. Sure, yeah, both really good questions. Try to repeat them if you would. Yeah, yeah, so the first question I believe was uh, specific challenges that uh, come up during the d design process or anything that stands out. And the second question I believe was, are there any cool features that we wanted to include but, but couldn't? 
Um, yeah, there's two things that come to mind. So in terms of what challenges that come up or challenges that stand out for this product, mm -hmm. I don't know if you had the same perception, but the hand pad was certainly one of the things that I don't think anybody expected to be as challenging as it mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. I mean, we went through over a hundred different prototypes of hand straps because we wanted, we basically had to convince ourselves that we chose the right direction for the hand pad. And the ironic thing is that we, the hand pad, the final design of the hand pad ended up being very close to the first iteration of the Do hand pad. Do you know pad. how often that happens? Yeah, I, I think it happens company. quite often. Yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable. And it's, yes. it's like almost like you don't trust your own intuition when you're designing products. You're like, it can't be that easy. It's got to be a hard fought process in order to get to, like, in order to get to the final version. But I think it's totally a necessary part of the process because it's not, it's not wasted effort, right? You've gone through 150 different things that you know definitely don't work. You have proof that they didn't work. You've tried them, you've got user input on them. You know that they're not good options. And so the final product you end up being that much more confident in. Yeah. So I think the hand pad for sure was, and we had a bunch of different versions of the hand pad. This is a very simple, very smelt, very thin, but comfortable version of the hand strap. That's stitchless, it's just laminated with two uh, types of premium Japanese micro suede fabric that I think most people are very happy with the final result. Mm -hmm. um, I know I am in terms from from an aesthetic standpoint and just from a comfort and utility standpoint, I'm very happy with the way the hand pad turned out. Mm -hmm. But we had all kinds of weird stuff, I and mean, we had things with plastic stiffeners put in them, and all kinds of padding and all different shapes. We even had a, the magnetic taco thing at the very <laughs> end there That's that right. we were prototyping. Uh, and the, the hard lesson there was that more features and more thickness and more rigidity and more padding actually had the opposite effect of what we intended, which is they actually made the product more uncomfortable because the product is meant to go over and under fingers and kind of interlace between those fingers. If you make the pad very stiff, it's perceived as discomfort. So you can't just add thickness to the pad and add padding. It doesn't work that way. That's definitely a standout challenge for this product in terms of functionality that we wish we could have at, uh, added, but didn't ultimately. Um, mm -hmm. I do think there, again, early on in the design process, we made a little bit of a detour when we were talking about the tool, the integration of the tool into the plate. We did do a canned fastener. I don't know if you ever saw this, but we did a, like the, there was the fastener, but it had a little canned lever on it. Mm. And the goal was to do a toolless uh, design where you would flip a cam on the, the you basically flip the lever on the fastener, which would release tension on the plate, and then you'd pull the plate off or you'd unthread. At that time, we were still thinking it would be unthread, unthreaded completely from the camera. We looked at the, there was a couple issues with that, although, you know, I think in a different product, we probably could make that work, which is a toolless standard plate or something, something very similar to it. There's a lot of stack implications. Once you start looking at the spring that's required for the cam and the lever, and you want a lot of throw, basically you want a lot of difference in height between the ver when the cam is open and when it's closed. You need quite a bit of compression to get the plate to stay in position on the bottom of the camera. All those things add to the stack up. They add to the complexity of the part. They make things more expensive. You end up with more failure modes. Um, and we looked at that, and there was also a lot of ergonomic issues where you need access to the lever of the cam, and it could end up in any position depending on how you screwed it onto the bottom of your camera, so that you need to remove a bunch of material from the plate to get access to the lever, and now it doesn't look like an actual, like, design, you know, it doesn't look like a des uh, something that was intentionally designed that way. You, know, you, you have, uh, during the course of development, you can test a lot of things, but you can't test everything, right? And so you have to rely on your intuition and basically, you know, how far you pursue a design decision is very much sometimes an intuition, mm -hmm. which is, are we going to, if we continue to pursue this, is anything going to come of this? Mm -hmm. Or is this just going to be a wasted effort? And uh, every, I think every designer has those moments during the development process where they have to, there's like a hundred other things they want to try, but you have to make an internal calculation into what am I going to get out of this if this succeeds and what am I giving up in exchange to make that feature work? And that was one of the features where I made an internal judgment that I was going to give too, too many things up and that the user was gonna, definitely going to perceive in the final product that I, I was, was not willing to compromise the, you know, the looks of the product. I wasn't willing to do all, you know, possibly all these UX trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And I, we opted to go with a tool, which is the basic bulletproof version of, of getting the plate, getting enough input torque into that fastener to get the plate affixed on the bottom of your camera so it doesn't mm -hmm. move. It was a hard decision to make, though. I think we really wanted to make that work. We put a, we put a good amount of energy, engineering effort into trying to make that work, or at least trying to assess how complicated that would be. And it ended up being something that was just not going to be a good fit for this product. Mm -hmm. Maybe for a future iteration. Hmm. Uh, this came up a lot with Clutch. Uh, did you guys have any prototypes that used the anchor system instead of the triangle ring? Why didn't we use the anchor at the top? Mm. The anchor at the top. 
Yeah, I, that, that, that did come up with the clutch a lot, and I think I was actually one of the, the, the very vocal proponents of trying to use that. Here we have like probably, I think, the most ubiquitous lens, or excuse me, um, strap attachment system in the world, and we're not using it on our hand straps. And so it seemed a little bit antithetical, but I think that there are, are two, two problems with that. I mean, it, really the problem didn't, w w that, that existed on clutch didn't go away with micro clutch. With the anchor system here, you've got a little bit, you've got about 20 millimeters worth of kind of free cord um, before the anchor begins, and then you've got about 35 millimeters worth of rigid plastic that is going to, uh, you know, take up this, this, this whole zone. And you simply need to begin the curve and you, of, of like controlling the materials and how it's going to stack up against the hand much earlier than anchors allow for. So it just, Boy, it feels like we should be utilizing the anchors, but it's not the right call. Obviously, we did on the bottom here, which I think is is is, is nice, but that did not make sense for micro clutch because we needed the. Dane, actually, this is this is perfect. You should talk about why we didn't use the anchor right. on the bottom. So you need a hard attachment point at the bottom right hand corner of the camera in order for the strap to work. In order to leverage the camera's weight off your fingers so that you can basically carry this thing around effortlessly without actively holding onto it, mm -hmm. you need to have that hard attachment point at the very, bo very bottom of the camera all the way to the right. And that was there, that feature was there from day one for mm -hmm. most versions of micro clutch. Art and Joey, who I think deserve a shout out here. Um, so micro clutch, I obviously had spent a lot of time, but Art and, mm -hmm. uh, Art and Joey had spent a lot of time before I even got to micro clutch thinking about the requirements and the architecture of this product. And actually they had come up with that rigid plate mm -hmm. um, idea. And the reason for that is because that's how you make the ergonomics of the product work. Although I heard from Art um, a couple team meetings ago that actually we owe some credit to yeah. uh, German fella who we don't know, who we met at Photokina sure. in 2014. So if you're out there listening, uh, 2015. 2015. Yeah. It was our yeah. It was maybe our, our second or third Photokina, um, and he came up and and showed a prototype of a product to Art, and he said, "Hey, this is what I do." You didn't know the story better. Yeah, perhaps. from what I understand, a, a photographer approached our lead designer, Art Major, with a hand-built prototype that was an L bracket that had a hand-fashioned hand strap put on it. And he believed, he's like, this is what the future of hand straps look like for mirrorless cameras. It's got to be, it's got to be something like this. Yeah, I think he convinced Art at the time that it had real utility, but at the market at the time, I think it was still very much in DSLR world. Mm -hmm. They hadn't fully made this transition to, well, I, we're still not really fully transitioned to mirrorless cameras, but we're definitely in the midst of that transition. Mm -hmm. So in 2015, it felt like an interesting thing, but not something that was obvious at the time. And I yeah. think Art kind of held on to that idea of like, hey, you know, maybe the thing's a, a plate like this guy had shown him, and maybe that's the product that we need to make for mirrorless cameras. And totally. so that, that was kind of the inception of that. Well, if you're listening, we got a free micro clutch and a t-shirt for you, okay, buddy? <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of people are asking about other straps um, with micro clutch. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. So, uh, for a micro clutch, there is a dedicated anchor mounting point on the bottom of the plate. So, we know that we're taking up the existing tripod mounting location. So, we're giving you an alternate mount mounting location that's in a pretty similar location to a typical standard plate. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead and try that? Sure, why not? Um, so, number one, there's one built into the plate. Number two is in the ARCA plate that comes with micro clutch, there's four additional mounting locations in that. And if you happen to be uh, an owner of one of these smaller mirrorless cameras where carrying on either side of the eyelet is a better configuration. So, what P Pete's holding an A7, and I think most people at, at Peak Design kind of carry these larger one, cameras the, one same, more anchor. the same way, which is. It's usually left eyelet and then bottom, right? Mm -hmm. That leaves the grip mm -hmm. free in order to uh, hold the camera so you don't end up with an anchor or an anchor housing in your hand. This is actually an even more ideal location for an anchor attachment, so long as you desire to have your, uh, your lens facing down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we do allow for that carry position for the, for the owners of these smaller mirrorless cameras. All you need to do is there's a uh, little silicone protector that goes on over the top of your split ring there. We made that part specifically to make sure that the metal of your split ring is not touching your finger because your finger is going over that location. Uh, all you have to do is basically move this 
um, it's made of silicone, so it's very stretchy and it's pretty compliant. All you have to do is pull it up to expose the split ring, and then you can just tie into that location. So yep. if you have another anchor link there, you can tie into that location, and you can just carry your camera as if it had no strap on it. You still have access to both eyelets on either side of the camera. While I wrestle with this triangle ring, mm -hmm. um, I think it's actually really clever. When you when you get this product, um, do you have one of the I installation that, yeah, tools yeah, yeah. in sure. there? Yep. It comes with a tiny injection molded uh, split ring installation tool, mm -hmm. which I think is as clever as any other part of the product. We, we, we have to, so th there is some precedent for this tool existing. I think I, I don't know who came up with oh, this I'm, tool. I'm aware. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. So it, it it's been kicking around. We we definitely did a custom version for um, for our product just to make the experience of installation as smooth as possible. Uh, Tom made a, a similar tool for our oval shaped split rings. Yep. ship of those products and obviously we weren't going to hang people out to dry uh, with our version of the triangular split rings yeah it's uh, it's really cool though I mean it's got it's got good graphical instruction on on, on, on how to do it um, it's uh, it's pretty neat there Dane so it just opens opens it up am I doing it completely right there have you seen this product before <laughs> <laughs> so that is harsh. yeah it basically it's like a butter knife you basically just Part the split ring on the bottom. Uh -huh. Let's give you, let's give you a peak design split ring that's meant for this. It'll work on any split ring, but we'll we'll give you the actual oh, official you. one. Yeah, you gave me. I mean, that was yeah. a setup, dude. That yeah. was... um, you basically push oh, it on, and then you just spin it, and then it'll splay it open for you. Yes, so if correct. We got to put it on the left side of that camera. There we go. There we go. And just yank the tool out. Yank the tool out. Finish spinning it around. There you go. Make me look bad on camera. Well, you look better now that you've got it on there. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Jen, any other questions over there? Um, well, since you're coming out with the strap for smaller cameras, is there any plans for a Fuji or Micro Four Thirds lens kit? Man. I, you knew that question was coming <laughs> at some point, right? <laughs> yeah. Fuji, is there a, basically, is there a Fuji lens kit or Micro Four Thirds lens kit coming? There's not. <laughs> There's not. I give so much respect for the owners of Fuji cameras. In fact, I, I'm considering switching from, from Sony to Fuji almost because I, I just, I, I cannot, like, the Fuji fans are just so rabid and they care about their products and their photography so much, so I kind of feel like i got to figure out what it's all about. But irrespective of that sentiment, no, we're not going to be making any more lens kits. It's funny, that was uh, that the decision to make that product in the first place when Rob Jankura came on, he, he got hired to build the tripod, and I don't know how we ended up getting so distracted by, it was like, hey, let's just put this lens kit together real quick. We, we, it, it, won't, it won't be long. Well, of course it was a long development cycle. It was a hard product like any other. Um, and no regrets in making it whatsoever, but anyway, we're not going to be uh, opening the effort back up to more of those. There's just too many other uh, really juicy fruit on that tree. That Peak Design roadmap is anything but parched. Um, honestly, one of my hardest jobs now as CEO is, is, is resourcing and trying to figure out the balance between growing at the right pace so that we don't grow too fast and ruin the good things we've got here, but also trying to satiate all those really wonderful product ideas that we have on the roadmap. So that one is not there right now, uh, regrettably. All the Fuji users say you won't regret making this. <laughs> okay, all right, good to, good to know. Um, and with that, and how much Actually, hang on, I wanna take this for a moment. Okay, one thing that I, I'm going to just put this out there. This is a, a more general case about photography and about, about, about cameras and the interplay between phones. I'm sorry, this is a bit of a, a um, sidetrack. But what I want is when I take a photograph with my camera, I want it to show up seamlessly on my phone. I know I can connect to the Sony Wi-Fi network and that when I turn it off, it'll automatically download, but it is absolutely as fiddly as can be. It's just no fun. Trust me, I've, I've, I've tried so many ways. Why isn't there a can camera manufacturer who's listening who thinks deeply about how to integrate the card that shows up here and replicate that 
on my phone at the same time. Because too often as a photographer, I'm pressed between my phone and my camera and knowing that like, yeah, for certain things, I might print them out and put them on my wall, but for so many other things, I want simple sharing, but I still want the joy of using a real camera, but the pain in the ass is too large. And so like it's creating this, this, this choice paradox that's no fun and has forced me to use, or not forced me, but like caused me to use my iPhone way more frequently than I would want to. I think I would be so, so much more of an engaged photographer if one of these can, camera manufacturers could figure out how to just get those, phone, those pictures onto my camera roll without me having to think about it. It doesn't seem like it should be that hard. Okay, I've said it. We can move on to Mike. Someone says the Fuji X app just came out of the I was just going to mention that, yeah. Is it good? Is it really? I haven't really? tried it, but from, from what I understand, it only works for the newest Fuji phone cameras. It's well, like, that's the one I'll get. Problem solved. Yeah. It's a business I expense. Mean, I think a lot of people have that similar experience, and there's probably a lot of smart people working on that. And it's well, probably not trivial. Not, not a trivial. That's how it works? Oh, boy. He's locked into the Fuji film That's going to be now. revolutionary. That is good. I've been waiting for this. Oh, man. Okay, excellent. Great. Maybe an X-T5 um, in your future. That's kind of it. A lot of other people are just asking if, there's, if we can tease anything about upcoming projects or things on that road. I mean, I, I love teasing things on the up. I mean, you saw that, like, that's, I just want to spill all the beans. I knew, but then people who have, like, serious jobs here actually get kind of pissed at me when I do that. They don't think it's the right tactic. Um, I, <laughs> man. It's not passing legal. Um, Bridget's in Florida right now. She's fine. Um, Hmm. Look, I sometimes when I talk about products and um, and what we're going to be doing with the future. Look at Adrian just showed up, <laughs> Chief Worry Officer. Adrian just showed up to intimidate me into not spilling too many beans. Yeah, don't let him do anything. Yeah, he's going to regret it. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. Like Wizard of Oz, he just appear from behind the curtain. Look, we have planted several flags now, right? We make, we make camera accessories. We make clips. We make straps. Um, we're going to, I, you know, I, I think that we're the market leader there. I think both in terms of sales and, 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 and the innovations that we've come through. We need to continue to support that flag, right? We need to be the premier uh, photo accessory manufacturer. So there's going to be more that, that goes into that. Um, we've obviously planted our first flag with Travel Tripod. We're not done. Uh, you know, I, I said when we launched that campaign, like, we are a, we're a tripod company now. Um, and, yep, it's been quite a bit of time since we've released uh, another tripod. Um, we're not doing nothing. Um, another flag that we've planted um, is you know, our everyday line of bags, which I think are basically first photography bags, um, but they really do work for everyone. And that's been an interesting play, right, where about 25% of the people who own one of those bags don't even own a camera. Um, that's great. It was kind of one of the first products that allowed us to sell to a more general consumer. Then we planted the flag of travel and all of our travel accessories. And there's nothing that we sell more of than our travel products at Peak Design. Um, I don't know who all these people are buying packing cubes, but I am deeply grateful. Um, there, there are a lot of organization hounds around there, it seems. Um, travel is such a, such a big, broad word. Our travel line that you see both thoughtfully integrates photography um, but also has just kind of an elegance and a clean aesthetic to it that, that is sold more broadly. Obviously, that line of travel products is missing what you might refer to as the apex predator of that uh, line of travel products. And um, let's just say we're very excited about what that animal might be. How was that, Adrian? Thanks. Um, then there's... Uh, there's another flag in the soft goods world. Actually, I mean, there's, there's a lot more flags in the soft good worlds that, that we care a lot about. If we are, 
If we endeavor to call ourselves leaders in Kerry, which Lawrence does nearly every day when he gets up, he looks in the mirror and says, I am a leader in Kerry. Uh, you know it's true. Um, and uh, there, you know, we don't make products that are primed for the real outdoor experience yet. Um, and a lot of my roots as a photographer are in those environments. There is probably no activity on this planet that I enjoy more than backcountry camping and photography when you combine those two things. So I think that those passions that I have, as do many people here at Peak, um, we'll see what happens when those intersect with our, with our soft good capabilities. Um, uh, Obviously, more recently, we have planted a very big flag with something that we call mobile. Um, the, I don't need to explain too much that phones have become cameras and vice versa, and creating a connection system for that um, that is absolutely, unequivocally, the best connection system that exists on the planet. Um, is uh, another flag that we're not going to just kind of let let you know go go follow. Like we are going to be pursuing that category very hard because who knows what these phones are going to become in terms of cameras and the ubiquity in our lives is is um, unmatched. Um, I think we make the best damn phone cases in the world and uh, we're going to keep doing that with more styles, more colors, more optionality um, and. We've also been hard at work at upgrading the internals, uh, the magnetic systems that uh, allow for strong and, and decisive attachment um, without interference between wireless power. Like I, I also think that us becoming a leader in wireless power um, and how, how we're charging these products, um, that's certainly something that we're far more on the cutting edge than I would have expected that we can be. And people are going to see that with the iPhone 15 release coming out. Um, so we just, we have our, our, our hands in so many pots right now, and we're still do doing it with a small team. And I got to say, as you know, the only guy who's been here all 13 years that this has been in existence, Peak Design does feel like it's growing. We're growing up. We're almost like a, I mean, we have a leveling system and great benefits now. Although we do need to work on our dental plan. That was some bullshit. Um, but that was just a personal experience. Generally speaking though, we are growing up. Um, and I'm extremely proud of the leadership. And, and like, we put in a management structure that I was so opposed to for so long because I didn't want to have a corporate company. Are you make am I off the rails here? <laughs> Yeah. Um, we're talking about dental work and yeah. we started talking about the roadmap. <laughs> Hang on a second. Hang on a second. What I, what I mean is that Peak Design is growing. We're growing in headcount. We have awesome new faces uh, that are coming to join us with incredible talent, each and every one of them. Um, but to me, it still feels the same. And I think that's an important thing. And what I, what I mean by that is it still feels fun. It still feels the right combination of kind of homegrown and homemade, but extremely professional and, and really world leading in the categories we choose to interact in. So I consider myself very lucky uh, that this business has remained unchanged in that way. Um, and yeah, I think that for our fans and our backers and those who like and respect or love Peak Design products, I think that you can expect much, much more of the same, only better. That's my guess for you. Very elegant. Thanks, Dane. Thanks, Dane. Well, that's it. I think that's it. I think we got lunch coming up, right? Yeah. Okay. For our Kickstarter backers, I hope you've enjoyed Dane Jones. Yeah, thanks, everybody. For anyone who came to this wondering if Peak Design had put very full effort into MicroClutch for making it happen, holy shit, you know that now. Um, this product is so much better than I anticipated it would be when we got into it. And that is because of, honestly, a lot of people worked really hard, but Dane has thrown his whole back into this thing. And it's a, it's a magnificent product. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to discount the rest of the team. I mean, all along Absolutely. the way, we've had really great input from people who were part of the design team and even our, our beta testers and our users who were testing the product for us gave us wonderful input. Yeah. You know, there's, we, we accept good input from anywhere.
Absolutely, yeah. and the project managers That's who right. drive it home, mm -hmm. and all of our partners who are our manufacturing partners are still in mainland China and in Vietnam, soft goods in Vietnam, and our partners in mainland China. Um, a whole other interesting side of the business. No time to get into that today, but. Danger president. Huh? I gotta All think right. he's got some skeletons in the closet. We're not gonna want to do that. <laughs> yeah. That's my guess. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Take care. Boom chakalaka wanna get it California. Soup chili bowl, sticky bag of chicken. Run around while I naked in my PJs. Wubba dubba flubba wubby on my numbins. Hey folks. Hey folks. Look at your hands. Look at, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at. Cameras got smaller, but hands stayed the same size. Cameras got smaller, but hands stayed the same size. Cameras got smaller, but hands stayed the same size. Cameras got smaller. Pete said he wanted our marketing to be more serious. This is me being serious. Oh, I need to find a new job. Hand scientists? Not like, not like, not like, not like. The year was 2014 and it all was swell. Cars were driven by people. Twitter was a source of relevant social commentary. Cameras were large and hands were the same size as cameras. Peak Design's newfangled clutch hand strap was all the rage, giving superior grip and comfort for the chunkiest of DSLR cameras. It was a simpler time, a peaceful time. Oh, I need to find a new job.